to Junction One this evening. Hello from me too. It's great to see everybody. Uh, tonight, I just want to start by reading from Acts 17 and verses 26 and 27. Um, God ordains all things and we should seek him. I think there's a strong theme tonight about how God has plans and purposes for us. And uh, I'll, I'll just read from verse 26. From one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. And uh, tonight Sharon Jelf is going to pray for us and, and Sharon used to live near to us and it, it, the, the verse about uh, the exact times and places where we should be, uh, I, I find very significant. Sharon lived around the corner, had our babies at the same time. Uh, Sharon, through through the early years when our children were small, became a Christian, got baptised and, and has been a Christian for, for over 15 years now. So it'll be great to hear Sharon pray for Broms Grove and Junction 1. Great. We're also going to be hearing from Simon, Simon Maudsley. Some folks might know Simon, but he's going to share his faith story with us about how he came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And then also he is going to be sharing the message as well. So we're really looking forward to hearing from Simon. Um, before we do that, I'm just going to uh, pray for us tonight. Lord, thank you that you have a plan for each person. Lord, you made us. You made us as the unique people that we are. And you made us with a great purpose. You made us so that we can glorify you and enjoy you forever. So, Lord, we pray that as we meet together tonight, that your presence would be with us and we would have a sense of this great purpose for which you made us. We thank you that you are the God who redeems people. You save us and you save us with this great purpose. So, Lord, we commit ourselves to you. We pray that uh, as we hear from Simon tonight, as we hear his story of how you came into his life, and as we hear from your word, Lord, we ask that you would indeed meet with us. And we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, before we hear from Sharon praying, uh, we're going to worship God as we sing. Thank you. 
Hello everyone and blessings to you all. My name is Sharon Jelf and I live in Bath. I've lived here for 14 years. Um, prior to that I lived in Birmingham um, where I attended Molly Hall Church. I just wanted to say what a privilege it is to, um, to pray, to be praying today for Junction 1 and for Bronze Grove. Um, so let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you that we can come to your throne of grace to praise, honour and glorify your name. You are a God of compassion and care and a God who loves to save. We just want to pray blessings on the people of Bromsgrove. There are hearts and minds to be one in the Bromsgrove area and Lord, you know everything about the people there. And we just pray that your Holy Spirit will lead Junction 1, that they will be a light in the darkness, spreading your gospel. Just want to pray for opportunities to witness, Lord. Thank you for Junction 1 and the work it is already doing. I do also pray that you will continue to guide them and, and um, guide the leaders and unify them, that they will be able to build this church and it will be a blessing to all around. Just pray, Lord, for fresh ways um, and exciting ways to reach the people of Bromsgrove and beyond. So just pray, Lord, now for your blessings and for your guidance and for your wisdom. And thank you, Lord, that you are always with us and you are always in control. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you and lovely to um, be, be able to share with you today. Uh, it's brilliant to have Simon Maudsley here with us today. Simon runs a church in Stoke-on-Trent. I think it's called Park Church, Simon. Is that right? And uh, right. Simon, just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background. You're from Birmingham originally. Just, just fill us in on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was uh, born in a Christian home, and uh, I was. Um, my dad was a pastor, and uh, I was sort of brought up generally strictly, lovingly, but strictly, um, and. Oh, I don't know. Uh, when by age about eleven, this was in Birmingham. At age about eleven, twelve, I started to push back a bit, and I got a bit fed up with what I saw as religion and uh, a code of conduct and rules being pushed down my throat. And my brother too. We both kind of felt similarly at a similar time. Uh, and then, round about age thirteen, twelve, thirty, I started to look for perhaps a bit more of an another acceptance, another group that would that I could fully be myself in. And I I decided at that point myself was not a Christian. Uh, so I just sought out some lads back uh, at school, got into what they got into, you know how it is, peer pressure and all that, or, or just wanting to be accepted for who I am, uh, loved for who I am, a sense of belonging. I didn't get that because I was rebelling uh, towards my family, especially what my dad stood for. I hated the fact that he was a pastor, a preacher, and I just wanted to get as far away as possible. And things got progressively worse uh, till I was drinking all the time, uh, experimenting with other recreational drugs, using some of those for a period of time, and always uh, cannabis or weed, if you want to call it that, that was always on board. But alcohol for me was the staple, that was the important thing. Plus the music, the lifestyle, took many risks with my life. I lived for the lads. I always went further than anybody else did in our group. I think really when I look back, because I wanted to be adored, 
I wanted to be accepted, I wanted to be noticed, I wanted to be significant. Those lads became my world, I lived for them, and they became my family. It's so in conflict with the Christian lifestyle. How did you come through to a place where actually God became everything to you? Reluctantly, and not because I particularly wanted that, but when I look back, God put things in place in my life where I had to take a long, hard look at myself. But probably the first significant thing was I was really worked over and beaten up by a gang from Birmingham um, and put in hospital and it was in the papers and I had criminal injuries. And I think with that, um, that was due to my escapades as a drunk and as using drugs at the time. I was beaten in and out of unconsciousness and then when they went, I looked at myself in the mirror and I couldn't, couldn't recognize myself. My eyes were out, my nose was across, black and blue. I looked in the mirror of that toilet and I thought, what are you doing? And I think that was the very first um, ugly sight externally of what was going on inside. I brushed it off. Uh, I went around for about three months with lots of mates because I was scared, but it just made me drink all the more. And then I forgot about it. And then my liver, um, in 1987, I think, uh, I, I started to feel very unwell. I had tests, my liver was failing, I was diagnosed by general surgeon at the um, general hospital uh, called Elias, uh, Elwin Elias. Um, he told me I should never drink again. Um, when I look back now, apparently, I've been diagnosed since as having alcoholic liver hepatitis. And then um, everything was taken away from me and I was on my own and I had a lot of time to reflect and I watched a video called Jesus of Nazareth years and years and years ago and the Robert character Powell. of Jesus, Robert Powell, uh, you know the story, <laughs> better than those probably. Good old, good old and, uh, <laughs> anyway, something was different. I was on my own, I was watching it and those words of Jesus found in the Gospels in the Bible spoke right into my life and over a period of time absolutely crushed me. I was in bits. I never ever cried. I was dead inside and that's how I felt, stone cold dead. I felt angry, I felt sad, I never felt emotional, never cried and I was reduced to tears many many times. And in the end, I began to realize that this Jesus who my dad kept banging on about was real. Um, I had sworn to my dad I would never go to church again after being 17. I was now 25. And uh, this Jesus who I thought had nothing to do with me started closing in on me um, to the point where he terrified me. He, he, he began to convince me that if I did not turn to Jesus and have my sins forgiven by him, I would be heading right into hell, a lost eternity without him. And I used to just joke about that. I'll be there in hell, there'll be wine, women and song, we'll be stoking the fire like all the rest of them, be an all night party, who cares? But this time God threatened me for the vote from the, with the very thing that I used to poke fun at. And it became a reality. So one night, I just couldn't go to sleep, and I thought, look, you know me, God. I didn't know really who it was, but I knew it was God. I knew it was somebody outside of myself. I knew it wasn't psychological. It definitely wasn't just emotional. There was someone trying to get into my life, and he went about it in a very strong way, almost an offer I can't refuse. <laughs> so I came to a crossroads that night, uh, Jesus throws, if you like. Just, just to picture the scene, I'm picturing because I, I remember your bed sit. This is just you in your bed sit in Sally Park in Birmingham, you and God, and you're you're totally convinced that the presence of God is there. That's that's what you're saying. Yes, and what a pokey old bed sit it was, Rachel. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway. Um, so yeah, and then that night, um, a friend of mine, Don Morris, Morrison, came over. He explained the way more clearly to me about how to trust Jesus. Then he cleared off. I think it was 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, 
and I was just wrestling. I didn't want to trust Jesus, but I kind of knew that he was real and what he said about himself was now true. That's what conviction is. God comes into your heart and he says, you might have heard about me, but now I'm going to show you what this means in your life. And um, I was guilty as charged. I was a sinner sticking up two fingers and a fist towards God. And he backed me into a corner and he basically said, look, here's your choice. You know, I'm real now. You know, I love you. You know, I laid my son's life down for you. And if you come to me, your sins can be forgiven and taken away from you, along with the condemnation and the death sentence of hell. Or carry on refusing me and go your own way and see how that goes. But I think you know the answer. So that was so real to me. I kicked against it. I didn't want my dad to say, I told you so. Not that he did say that. I didn't want to admit anything. Uh, I didn't want a life that was full of Christian friends and praying and reading the Bible and so many odd people in the church, let's face it. And I, I just thought, no, I can't do that. But I had no choice. Well, I did have a choice, but it was a stupid choice. Because when something's true, it doesn't matter what your reasons are. You've just got to go with what's true. When something's true, you live your life by it. You stake everything on it. You do that in your life. Um, so I did. And I reluctantly came to the Lord and I remember saying, I, uh, you know I don't want to come to you. You also know that you are the truth. Um, so deal with my unwillingness because I'm going to trust you anyway. And what happened, Simon? What happened as a result of that? From that moment, everything changed. I know not everybody has such a dramatic experience, but it's the same principle. Um, literally, I knew that this presence was in the room. And the next thing, when I asked him to forgive my sins and come into my life, that presence was in my heart. So I knew about him and then I knew him. Um, I knew I was a sinner and forgiven. Suddenly I was forgiven and swept clean. I very rarely smiled in those days. and I, I was just con conscious of having, grinning like a Cheshire cat. And I got up off my knees. I looked in the mirror because I, I didn't know why my mouth sort of had a coat hanger in it. And so I went to the mirror and I thought, what on earth is going on? I looked at me and my eyes were like lit up, not like a vision or anything just spark just so full of life and uh and i had this smile uh, and i just remember saying this is the best hit i've ever had never mind alcohol never mind drugs this is what i want now that's not probably the best way of describing an experience it was, of God, you, it was words you had it was words at that time came as you yeah, were yeah. yeah and i remember saying it costs nothing uh i'm not skint because of it um, it's deeply satisfying. It's literally out of this world. And uh, I, the evidence was there for me. I, uh, literally, I sent out a prayer to the Lord to come into my life and he turned it around in such a dramatic way that I could not doubt it. Now, Simon, does, that's quite a few years ago now. How many years have you been a Christian? Uh, 25, 57, 32, 32 years. Okay. Yeah. So, so you've had a, like a long journey now as a Christian and your faith is just as sure or more sure even than it was then. And, you know, you're a minister now. So, so what's that 30 years? I know you can't talk about it over here all day, but what's that 30 years been like? You know, I guess there's been highs and lows in life, the same as everybody has. What's that been think, then? Um, from now till then, uh, there was many other things. Uh, I had all sorts of insecurities. Praise God, a heck of a lot of those have now gone. Um, I have become more and more rooted in the Lord so that I care primarily what he thinks and not what other people think, first and foremost. That the belonging I searched for is complete in, in God. I belong to him. That the identity I search for, I now am a son of the Most High God. Well, you can't get better than that. Um, the uh, intimacy I look for is found totally in Jesus. Um, you name it, everything. The security I look for is eternal. I couldn't care less whether I drop dead after this interview or even enjoy it during it because I know where I'm going. I'm not afraid of death. I used to be. Um, well, massive changes. So in the answer to my question, my faith has just got 
stronger and stronger. I've had crises, I've had doubts back in the day, but it's got stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And I could never imagine, ever in a million years, going back to any kind of life without Jesus. I love it. Absolutely brilliant. And just Simon, finally, if, if there was uh, one word you'd have to say to anybody listening in today who's joined our gathering who isn't a Christian yet, uh, maybe someone even with some of the issues you've had, but someone who's saying, you know, I, can this be for me? And perhaps someone who hasn't got such an extreme ex experience as you've had. Um, what's the kind, is there like a Bible verse or something you'd like to share with them that you think this is what you really need to hear? I think just off the top of my head, I think that each one of us, we either look to family for belonging or security or identity or intimacy, or we look to another human being and we're all worshippers. We will all live for worship means to live for something. We all live for something or someone. People say my family is my world. They say, oh, I love my job. I can't get enough of it. And, and you live for that job. Whatever it is that you live for. The Lord designed you to live for him. And that is stuck in our hearts, whether we like it or not, from the word go. Bible says eternity is set in the hearts of everyone, yet we cannot fathom what God does. Well, I'm just saying to you that every single person out there, including you, has this huge void in the center of your personality which only God can fill. And what you're doing is you're filling it with everything else but him. That's exactly what I did. You don't have to be an addict. You don't have to be strung out. It's just a normal thing that everybody has. And the only way deepest satisfaction, forgiveness, guilt gone, uh, security, belonging, identity is fully satisfied is when Jesus comes right into the middle of your heart because it was designed for him to fill and nothing else. So that's what I'm going to say to you. Thank you. And I think interestingly, the times that we've sort of lived in in the last three or four months, I think loads of people have said, we've been stripped from so many things, haven't we, like that? Stripped from our, many people, their jobs even, but our lifestyles and all those things that we've held dear. And uh, it, it has caused, I think, a lot of people to reflect, hasn't it, at this time? I'm sure you've seen that I in think, the situation. I think we, we would say that on our on our online services, we've had double the amount of people that would normally listen and i think that's because I, I think it's deliberate i think god has put us all in a position because we never reflect we always busy ourselves we distract ourselves he's put us in a position with corona to reach out uh for him because everything else is falling apart in front of our eyes everything we once took for granted yeah 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 I always think as well, like, particularly worry and anxiety is really big, and I've, I've been really struck. The, the Bible verse, do not be anxious, has just before it, you know, the Lord is near, and that's the reason we don't be anxious. And I think that's what you've shared today, Simon, brilliantly, just how near and how real the Lord can be to you. He can come in and save someone like yourself who had no desire for him, and he can be real yeah. to anybody listening in today. So it's just, a brilliant, it's just brilliant to hear your story again. I've, I've heard it a few times now. We've done this interview a few times, but I never, ever tire of hearing it. So brilliant yet again. So. You're very kind. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Thank it's been you, great to be with you. And, I, and we're going and, to be uh, you because we're going to have a sermon from you coming up next as well. So thank you for sharing that right. as well. Can I, can I just say one more thing? You may. If you, don't, if you don't do anything else in your life, at least give Jesus the benefit of the doubt and look and seek out his claims. And if they ring true for you, You've got nothing to lose but to trust him. Brilliant. Last That's word this ever, Simon, goes to you. The last word is yours. Thanks for <laughs> okay. <laughs> See okay, Bye. then. Bye.
Greetings and a big hello to my friends at Junction One. We're wanting to raise our gaze today to the greatness of God by looking at what makes God happy also makes us happy. And we're going to look at the Father's happiness in the Son as, the create, as they create the world. Just a few thoughts of inspiration for you to really get our juices going on how marvellous the Son is and to see the Son through the Father's eyes, which will truly cause us to rejoice. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, were involved in creating the world. We see that straight away in Genesis 1. But in the New Testament, particular emphasis is on the Son's involvement as the agent of creation. The Old Testament alludes to this in Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8 personifies wisdom as the craftsman at God's side. And the New Testament says that Christ is the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1 24 but to those whom God has called Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God Christ is the divine craftsman at God's side at the creation in Proverbs 8 John 1 3 backs this up through Christ all things were made without him nothing was made that has been made now I just want to animate the creation i want to use our imagination i want you to come with me just before it all happened genesis 1 verse 2 the earth was formless and empty darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of god was hovering over the waters now earth is this huge water-filled dark whatever mass and no human eye had been created. And if you had been there and you could see, you would have seen nothing at all because it would have been thick darkness. But in that darkness, there was many spiritual entities. There was a whole host of angels, we're told, as Job tells us. But if you could see that world, that spiritual world, you would see God the Father and God the Son, together like two supreme superheroes, standing over this formless, water-filled mass. And God the Holy Spirit hovering over the water. And there's a thrill in the air, a sense of expectation. There is something amazing about to happen. Something never known before in all eternity past. God hasn't done this before. That's why. And what's coming is completely new. And God, the Holy Spirit, is waiting for the application of the word of God. And then the living, breathing word of God, the Lord Jesus, steps forward and he speaks into the darkness and he says, let there be light. And there was light. And it dawns upon the formless earth for the very first time. Dark, deep waters start sparkling with light and the darkest night is invaded by the glory of God brighter than the sun would ever shine and the first day begins and time enters our world then God speaks the sky into being the divine craftsman at God's side picks up the sky shakes it so it opens out and stretches it above the earth Isaiah gives us this picture, 4022. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. Wisdom Personified says in Proverbs 827, I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep. And that's day two. Then God speaks the land into being and the water begins to recede and land rises out of the sea. And wisdom personified commands the seas, saying, Job 38, 4, uh, 11, this far you may come and no further. Here is where your proud waves halt. All the power. <laughs> 
Then at the Father's command, the divine craftsman makes trees and plants that bear fruit, hundreds, thousands springing up everywhere. Green lushness fills the land as far as the eye can see, and that's only day three. Then God commands the sun and the moon into being, and there they are. Then the stars, millions of them, lighting up the sky like a fantastic firework display. That's day four. Then God fills the seas with marine life. Whales, sharks, crabs, jellyfish. Birds begin to fly across the sky and the earth begins to teem with life. That's day five. Day six. Here we have the very first dawn chorus. And there's no one to hear it but God. Why? Because it's made ultimately for God's glory. Always was, always will be. But the creator hasn't finished. God calls into being all life on the land as well. And now the cocks are crowing and the dogs are barking and the cats are meowing and the cows are mewing and the lambs are grazing. Six days ago, this formless dark lump stood lifeless in eerie silence. Six days later, it's brimming with every kind of life you can think of. But amazingly, God still isn't done. The best is yet to come. And God then says, let us make man in our own image. And the Lord Christ forms the man, not from another animal, but out of the dust of the ground. Of course, there's still no life in the man at this stage. So the Lord gives the first mouth to mouth resuscitation and breathes the first breath of life into the very first man. And a man, not a baby, starts to move on the ground. Did he have a belly button? It's the only question we we'll won't know till we get to eternity. And first that man crouches and looks down at the earth from what he's just come from. Possibly a little confused, who knows? And then he pulls himself up and he looks around him and he sees the world for the first time in all its glorious perfection. He sees the abundant life, he smells the flowers and he hears the birds singing and he takes one of his first few breaths of wonderful, clean, unpolluted air and maybe he thinks to himself, whatever this life is, it's so good to be alive. But somehow he's conscious of another presence. And he slowly begins to look upwards. And this minute old, fully grown, sinless man finds himself staring into the eyes of the divine craftsman himself looking into the eyes of his creator. And he knows it because God has set eternity in his heart. He's designed to know God when he sees God. What an incredible introduction to the perfect life that God gives. What a glorious first meeting with the creator God. And what a joyful, incredible experience for the creator. Because we do know that the Lord is overjoyed at the work of his hands. God speaks to man and his very first words are those of blessing. Be fr I want the best for you. Be fruitful. Rule over all the earth I've given you. I trust you to do this. I give you everything. God rejoices in man. God saw all that he had made and it was exceptional. It was very good as everything that God makes. And wisdom personified, the craftsman tells us, I was rejoicing in his whole world and delighting in mankind. That is exactly how the father and son felt about humanity. Remember that. He delights in you. But how did God feel about God in the act of co-creating the world? Well, there's the two of them, as we've pictured, standing on the threshold of the universe, working together, creating together in perfect harmony. What does the father think about the son's creative work? John 17, 24, Jesus prays to the father, you loved me before the creation of the world. Proverbs 10, 1, a wise son brings joy to his father. 
When your son or your daughter gets saved, are you not full of joy? When they succeed in something, aren't you full of joy? Proverbs 23, 24, he who has a wise son delights in him. Many years ago, I had to move a lot of dirt from the garden. I hate gardening. Lockdowns kind of helped me appreciate it a little bit more, but my heart's never really in it. Anyway, I was moving a lot of dirt from the garden and I had a wheelbarrow and a spade, a big one. And Zach at that time, he was a little boy and he appears with his toy wheelbarrow. You know how it is. And he has his little spade. So I start shoveling large amounts of dirt into the barrow and he shovels tiny amounts into his little barrow. And we're working alongside each other and we're achieving the same task. I'm instructing him and he's following my instructions. And so you start talking and you're laughing and you might throw mud at each other, whatever. And he's, we're enjoying one another's company. There's incredible oneness that comes from being father and son working together for the same end. It truly is a joy. Me being older and uh, less enthusiastic, I take a breather. I look at my little son, he's digging away and he looks back and he gives me a smile. I smile back. It's kind of one of those special times you look back on. The love, the unity, the industry, the energy, the common purpose. Sometimes you long for those days to come back when they were little and yet we moaned most of the time through it because it was uh, quite tricky. But how wonderful it was in so many ways. Imagine then how the father felt as he looked upon his eternal son. Imagine how he felt as he issued the command and watched his son shape and fashion the whole universe before his eyes. God was delighted in his son. He was so happy in his son. He loved working with him. He loved seeing what he could do. He loved being with him. He loved sharing in the experience with his son. The creation of the world at that time was something new to God, to both of them. A totally new experience, a very happy occasion. And happy occasions are always best when they're shared with someone you love. The father rejoiced in his son at the creation. And we have said, whatever makes God's ha God happy, makes you happy. We must learn to look upon the Lord Jesus like the father looks upon him. Learn to look at what the son has done through the eyes of the father and all the emotions of the father will flow. And we may enter into the wonder and the awe and the love and the power and the care and the attention to detail and the perfection of the Christ as he creates the world and as he creates you. The Lord Jesus lovingly made this place for you to live in and he lovingly made you to live in it and he loved you so much that when you botched it all up and ruined what he'd made and in this in in the same way ruined yourself and ruined those around you he came back to make it right again and it cost him his very life and the father says this is my son in whom i delight listen to him Look to him, love him, live for him. Look no further, look nowhere else. He is all your heart truly longs for if you dig deep inside. He is intimacy that you've been longing for. He is contentment. He is love. He is security and belonging. He is pleasure. He is the deepest of soul satisfaction. He is happiness. And God is and always has been eternally satisfied with his son. And so can you be, because when you are satisfied in Christ, everything else takes its perspective and you fully believe and you immerse yourselves and you bathe yourself in all his attributes and all his qualities that are lavished upon you in his unconditional love. 
It's a great thing to be a Christian, friends. Be encouraged. Start moving on and up. Look up and tool up. Even in lockdown, even when things just are not right, it is well. It is well with my soul. Amen. <laughs>Simon, it was great to have that reminder that uh, in Jesus Christ, we can have a great relationship with our God and be near to him. Well, before we say goodbye, we would like to just uh, share a few thoughts or give you an update on things around Junction 1. Yep. So in the next few weeks over the summer holidays, we'll be meeting uh, not on YouTube, but we'll be meeting on Zoom. So to get onto the Zoom, you need to email info at junction1.org. And we would just love you all to be part of that. We're going to be reading the Bible together. We're going to be praying and sharing together. So so make sure you email in and join us for that. And we'll have a weekly email. So if you'd like to join that as well, just email in too. And we can put you on our weekly emailing. And from the autumn term, um, we're going to be moving Junction 1 from 6pm on Sundays 
to 10.30 on Sunday mornings. And we're very excited about that change. Uh, we hope that's going to enable more people to come along and for us to share this great good news of Jesus Christ with people. So from the awesome, when we next uh, have our meetings gatherings, yeah. and our gatherings, uh, it'll be at 10.30 on Sunday mornings. We're hoping it'll be in the Burcott Village Hall. So we're working on risk assessments and all the uh, making sure it's COVID-19 safe. But uh, hopefully we'll be there. But we'll also have a YouTube presence too for those that can't make it. So we're, we're working, as, as all churches are at this time, but we're working that through so that we can uh, serve you in the best way possible. Thank you, folks, for gathering with us tonight. And if you're listening on YouTube, thank you as well. It's been great that we've been able to share together. We'll see you on Zoom next week, those of you that are around. Yeah, we're going to close in prayer. Yeah, let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you for the message tonight that you are a God who um, can totally satisfy us. We want to thank you that love, joy, peace, contentment, security, pleasure and soul satisfaction comes from you. We want to thank you for who you are. Thank you that you've made us. Thank you that we can have a relationship with you. Praise you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Bye. See you soon. See you soon.